All right, welcome to the first session of the meeting uh, on time series clustering and classification. Uh, so I'll introduce the first speaker now, keynote speaker for this session. Uh, Professor Eamon Keo is Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at UC Riverside. He completed his doctoral work in 2001 at UC Irvine uh, and has won numerous career awards uh, in the intervening time and a number of NSF grants, one of which uh, has funded a series of tutorials uh, on topics of machine learning classification, which are available, or information about which is available on his website, well worth looking at. Uh, he's an expert in uh, solving similarity and indexing issues uh, in time series data. Uh, and he will talk uh, today oh, welcome, uh, on the topic of scaling time series data mining, scaling upward, I presume, to trillion uh, data series. Okay. So, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be in their company. If Google can handle my accent, I'd be really, really impressed. I'll do my best to speak slowly. <laughs> let me jump right into it. And here's the outline of the talk. And I'm going to begin by arguing the following. And I use the word argue advisedly because I'm going to make claims here which actually contradict other people's research and papers. But I'm going to convince you that I'm right and they're wrong. And so my first claim actually is, is that similarity search is the fundamental operation for almost all stream and time search problems. If you can do similarity search very well, everything else turns out, I think, is easy. Classification, question, a number detection, and so on and so forth. That's my first claim. And I'll explain what similarity search is in some detail first. My second claim is also kind of controversial, which is that the similarity search problem actually is now essentially solved. We are effective and as efficient as it basically ever need to be, or ever can be in some sense. And now we should actually spend time with these higher level problems, and that's a fundamental research problem. Let me jump right into it with a five minute tutorial about what somebody's search actually is, and then we'll move on. So somebody's search requires us to understand what it mean by similar. And that really comes down to what are the required invariances for your problem, I'll explain in a moment. And why is it so important to be fast? You probably already guessed why you'd be fast, of course, but I'll do that also. So here's a quick tutorial. It looks contrived, but it's a real problem we're working on. We have these large archives of historical manuscripts for about 800 years. And let's say we have a query. I find some interesting fish here, and I want to know are there similar fish in 17th century Portuguese documents, for example. So I have my database. I want to search. Here it is here. And somebody search simply says, take the query. Compare it to every single thing in my database, find the nearest fish, in this case, probably that guy there, I'm guessing, and return it as the nearest neighbor. And that's all it's somebody search is. Now, I said similar, and what do I mean by similar? Well, I'm going to have a distance function, here it is here, and distance function is simply a black box, and in the black box, you put in two objects, two DNA strings, two fingerprints, in this case, two fish, and it pops out a number. The number itself has no meaning, but the relative numbers do. So maybe the similar fish actually is 2.7 units, but a different random fish might be a much larger set of units here. And the question actually is, for any kind of data you have, time series in this case, and more interested in, is what's the right black box? What property should it have? And these are the invariances. So for example, I want my black box probably in this case to be invariant to color. And why is that? Well, the early document was scanned by Google. They were scanned in black and white. They were being cheap. So actually, I want the distance to be invariant to whether it's colorful or black and white. And likewise, the documents are scanned, actually they're not scanned, they're photographed from a distance, and the camera can move in and out, it can zoom. And so the size of the fish is actually only the apparent size. There's no information. I want to be invariant to this. And for many contexts, of course, the direction the fish is facing, left to right, right to left, makes no difference. I want to be invariant to this. So for any similarity problem you have, the question is simply, what do I need to be invariant to? And once you're invariant to those, you're in business. And the point, of course, is all context dependent. This is true for historical manuscripts, 
But in the real world, let's say underwater with a camera, color would make a big difference. And in the real world, a big fish might be a different species to a smaller version of it. And even this left and right asymmetry actually may not exist in the real world. There mm -hmm. are some fish which are asymmetric, uh, flounder in place, and they're asymmetric to the left and to the right, and this actually would make a big difference. So understanding the uh, invariants are very important, and we'll get to those in time series shortly. And then finally, why is speed so important? Why do we care? Well, the obvious reason is, of course, first of all, that the size of that that might be quite large. We might have a million or a billion or more objects in this, and measuring this function at every one could be quite slow. But actually, more importantly for what I'm going to talk about today is that very cool algorithms actually call this function for the subroutine many times, maybe a million or a billion times. So no matter how fast one iteration of this is, doing a billion times could be slow, it needs to be fast. Okay, one last little point here, which is useful a little better, is if I want to actually, I could search with those fish in the kind of time series space. I can actually take a shape, I can find the center of mass, I can unwind it into a one-dimensional sequence, and I can consider a one-dimensional sequence, it's actually the lossy transform. And actually, I, I'm sure there's two reasons, one which is we'll pop into a few slides later on, and secondly, it shows an important point, which actually is for many problems, the interesting part actually is changing the data from one data source to another. So I'll show you an example of this on the DNA to time series, uh, but you can change data from one form to another form all the time, and as it happens, it's a useful trick because often problems are easy to solve in one format. Lovely. Well, finally, ready to look at streaming data, which we talked about, streaming time series. So I'm going to spend the next half an hour talking about the utility of my research. Again, my claim is, if you can do this well, almost all problems are very trivial to solve. So here's a real time series, and some of these search simply means that I could grab a template, that this section here, and I could ask where its nearest neighbor, its most similar object, anywhere else in this time series. And my guess actually is it could match pretty well over here, for example. So with that one core subroutine, let's solve some problems. The first thing I want to do actually was hint at the introduction is find an outliers, anomaly, novelty, and so forth. How do we do this? And there are hundreds of these thousands of papers trying to do this, but here's a nice way to do it in some research. Let's imagine we take a subsequence here, and we ask, what is its nearest neighbor? So this guy here, it probably the nearest neighbor is probably this guy here or this guy here. And actually, for every single sequence here, I can ask the question, what is the nearest neighbor? And the one that has the largest distance to its nearest neighbor, I'm going to call it a time series discord. As it happens, this one section here in red has a very large distance to its nearest neighbor anywhere else, and hence it's called the discord. And I'm going to say I think it's an anomaly. And of course, as you can guess in this annotation here, it actually is truly an anomaly. It needs to be detected and flagged and whatnot. So this is what I introduced about seven years ago to find anomalies in time series. And the reviewers initially didn't like it. They said it's just too simple. But later on, empirical evidence showed actually it seemed to work very, 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 very well. And people said, well, it works in spite of being so simple. But actually, that's not true, of course, right? It works very well because it's simple. Because you don't have 15 pounds to tweak, and you can't impose your ideas upon the data set, and it tells you what the numbers you don't tell it in some sense. So pretty recently, within Kumar, did a kind of a bake-off on 19 data sets with nine different techniques, including this one. And as trivial as simple as it is, it works beautifully. It wins basically every single time. <coughs> So my point is, again, that the simple this much research that you solve a problem that people find quite complex, find an outlier. Let's look at another example of when we do some research, let's do clustering. So the first thing is, here's a trick. You can take DNA, which of course we know is a string of ATCGs, and we can make it into a time series. And it's actually a mean thing to do. So here's the DNA string for a human, and if you see a G, we're going to take a step up one, if we see an A, we're going to take a step up two, a C, we'll take a step down one, and so forth. So if I scan across a DNA string, I can make a time series. Here's a picture of it. It's actually kind of an interesting picture because it actually has its property being kind of back to everything else. But the point is, we have a time series. And you may know that for most mammals, this string is about 3 billion base pairs long. It's quite a long string. Okay, so I've now taken a chunk of human DNA about 72,000 base pairs, 72,000 time series data points long. Here it is here. And I'm going to ask the question, can I find its nearest neighbor of five other primates and then cluster those nearest neighbors? 
So I've done that. Here's our human DNA measure. And the nearest neighbor, perhaps not unsurprisingly, is some chimpanzee. And the next nearest neighbor is some gorilla, and then one orangutan, and so forth. And as it happens, this clustering is actually the correct clustering for the tree of life from external evidence. Uh, and the branch lengths even are almost right. They're not perfect, but pretty good. So just as, in passing, this actually could be a problem with scalability, right? Because not only do they have three billion base pairs for each primate, but you also have to go um, left to right and right to left because the DNA can be transposed. So it's literally a few tens of billions of base pairs. Making it scalable is interesting. I'll talk about that a little bit later. The point is, it's a cool question you can do with semantic research. Here's an need classification problem you can solve. So here's a mosquito. And which mosquito is it? There are 3,528 different species of mosquitoes. Which one is this female here? And actually, we can solve this with some other search, too. Now, I could solve it, ironically enough, with DNA, but DNA actually is still quite expensive and slow and clumsy. I want to do it on cheap. And I'm going to do it with time series once again. So I take the insect, and I put it into an insect read, and then I put it with sensor on the insect read just to watch her 24 hours a day. And I watch her for 24 hours and watch how active she was. And so this is a midnight, midnight, one day. And during the night time, there's a little bit of background activity. But an hour before dawn, she senses dawn, and she's very, very active. But the moment the sun peeks over the horizon, she simply stops. Does nothing basically all day. And then again, the moment the sun sets in the horizon, the huge breath activity for one hour, and then she begins to do some background again. So I've had this pattern. You might call it a circadian rhythm. It's actually a deal rhythm, but it's basically the same thing. And my claim actually is it's not a need, because as it happens, I've been collecting these little rhythms, making them basically, in many, many, many <coughs> insects. I have a nice archive of them, and I can measure the difference between the one I've observed, but a female insect, with all the ones I currently have, and look for the nearest neighbor. And the nearest neighbor here is the pretty good fit, is actually some aculics. And that's my prediction for a species, which actually happens to be correct. So the pink one's average over many, many females, but it's smoother, but it's basically the same shape. Uh, no kidding, in the daytime, and these spikes before and after it's off. So, this actually is a little bit um, offline, it's batch. But just like I've mentioned in passing, I want to actually do something like this, but in real time. So, particularly, here's my ambition. Imagine the insect 100 meters away. I want to be able to detect that insect sex and species in real time. That's a very, 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 very challenging problem. We've already made some progress with this. So in particular, if you're interested in really cool machine learning problems, I have some students who are, uh, come talk to me. I got lots of data, I got lots of cool problems and sub-problems and sub -sub problems on this very ambitious idea of classifying insects in real time from 100 meters away. But I'll do that offline. Let me show you yet another set of problems we can solve with some monkey search, this time motifs. So this insect here, a deep leafhopper, is one of maybe four or five thousand species of leafhoppers. Um, these are the insects which cause huge problems to merge. And we're talking about maybe 10 to 12 billion dollars of damage to plants every year. What the insect actually does is she drives her stylus, or she could be a team in this case, too, I into the plant, sucks out the sap, and takes the sugar out of the sap. And the behavior itself is pretty innocuous, it doesn't hurt the plant, but if one plant has a disease, and this insect jumps from plant to plant to plant, the disease will spread to all the plants. And again, we're talking about 10 to 12 billion dollars of damage just in North America alone for these insects. And some cause problems for grapes only, some cause problems for almonds only, and so forth. Uh, this particular one actually, uh, you might guess, that beats most of us out of plants too. So it's a tiny insect, it's hard to study. How can we study it? Well, of course, we're mostly engineered to like this here. Let's actually wire it up. <laughs> So you attach a small, tiny gold wire to the insect. It doesn't notice, doesn't care. And you can ground the wire to the plant, or to the ground itself. And you can measure very things like resistance or whatever the voltage on this insect. And now the insect does a little business on the plant, and we get time series. And of course, we all love time series in this room. So we can deal with time series potentially. But the problem is, when you do this for hundreds of insects over uh, months or years, you get just terabytes and terabytes of this stuff here. And what do you do with that? How do you make sense of all this noisy data, right? Uh, it's very, very intimidating, of course. And up to a few years ago, at least, most people were doing this, not doing this by eye. 
They were simply having my grad students go to this day after day looking for interesting stuff. And my claim actually is the reason is better than that. We didn't find motifs. So what are motifs? Time space motifs are patterns which are approximately repeated in the data. So the picture here is zoomed in. This pattern here, the red one occurred here. You can't see it in the scale, but trust me, it's there. And the blue one occurred right here. And so the pattern repeated itself almost exactly twice. And you don't believe that's a coincidence, right? Something happened there caused it in behavior to make this pattern appear twice. As it happens, actually, this is a known motif. What it corresponds to is the insect taking its stylet, driving it into the plant, and then withdrawing it just to find a sweet spot. And this is in a very prototypical way, and this is exactly what you get. So we ran an algorithm that says that we found a known behavior, which is nice, but not that exciting. But of course, we can look for other motifs and find unknown behaviors. This is exactly what we found. So here's a motif you can see it repeated twice in the data. Actually, it repeats itself quite a lot. These two examples. And we actually have video with timestamps of this data. We can go in and look and see if it's actually happening. And this is actually an unknown behavior we discovered. So this is actually a different uh, leap up of the same kind of thing. Uh, when it takes the sugar out of the liquid, it has some basically liquid that's actually now eject. This is called honeydew. It's also called manna from heaven. In, in the Bible, it's actually almost what manna actually is. But I, I digress. And when the bee feels large enough, she or he shakes its rear end to get rid of this little bee, and the bee bridges the, the uh, plant, and it causes exactly this pattern here. And again, this is an unknown behavior. So here's a cool example of how more teachers find interesting behaviors. The actionability of this actually, I won't talk about too much, but it has a such actionability. If we understand the behaviors, when we introduce controls, like pesticides, like um, other kinds of things, um, maybe predators, we can now think about how the intervention changes the behavior. I'm going to change the behavior in good ways, not bad ways, of course. So one exciting thing we can do with motifs, of I'll show you in a moment, is we can find rules in time series. This is actually very new work, unpublished, actually, and I think it's very, very exciting. I mentioned in the past that the problem I've apparently solved before but it wasn't. It was never shown actually the algorithm that was shown before finds high confidence rules in quantum mechanical random walk data. So it finds rules, but it's definitely no rules. And the opposite is true. It cannot find a rule, but the most likely to find after one heartbeat is another heartbeat. That's a very obvious rule that we would see very quickly, clearly, right? But the algorithm can't find it. So my point is, um, this actually is not a solved problem, but I'm going to show you actually we have solved it. So here's a data set of time series. And the question is, are there any behaviors or rules in this we can actually find? And it's hard to say in this scale, but actually at any scale, it's hard to see what's going on here. So the first thing I can do is actually I can find some motifs. So I asked the other to find a motif, and I found this. I'm not sure if it will come strong here and here, but it doesn't really matter. It's something like that. And again, when you see this behavior here, it repeats so well, you can kind of believe it means something. But what do I do with it? How do I use it? Well, one thing I could do simply is I could cut the data somewhere, fucking in half, take the average of the first two pieces, put it here, take the average of the second two pieces, put it here, and I'm going to claim this is actually a rule that this is an antecedent, this is a consequence. If I see this, then I will see this. And I'll turn to that thing to worry about, which is what do we need to see this? What's the distance between this and the data that it set as being seen this? And I actually estimate that by being twice the distance between the red and the blue. And then the question is, how long after I see this will I see this? And for the moment, I'm going to say instantaneously. But actually, I can generalize that. So now my claim is I have a rule, and if you give me more of this data, I think my rule will actually predict that data. And of course, prediction is a very, very cool thing to do. If you can predict certain things, you can make money or save a heart attack or something like that. So does it work? Again, here's the rule. I looked at new data, and in new data, the rule fired, and yes, it correctly predicted what it would see next. It does actually work. So let me now tell you what the data actually is. This is actually the first two choruses of the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, spoken by an American actor. And it's transformed into an FCC, just one coefficient. And so that happens, the rule corresponds to the first part corresponds to at my chamber, and the second part corresponds to door. So of course, in the ASCII space, it's very easy to do. Right? In ASCII space, we can find rules that they 
famous and famous thing at my chamber door. But finding it in Revali data is kind of missing inside. And it's not critical to do this because people don't speak perfectly as you might imagine. And the question is, how well does it actually generalize? So it generalizes quite well from American male to American male. So it probably will work for many people in this room if they decide at home. It doesn't generalize quite so well to females. It doesn't generalize quite so well to non-American males. But we're actually working on this, not only for this domain, but other domains, is how to generalize this. Now, of course, this actually is, in some sense, a contrived and silly example. Um, but finding rules in data more generally, in astronomy, in telemetry, in, in medicine, or not, is a very cool and problem to solve. And I'll just give you one hint of this. We look for rules not in human speech, but essentially in bird speech, in bird song. So for zero finches, which are obliging to sing all day long, we actually looked for some uh, rules, we found some rules, and then we tested the rule on the bird the next day, essentially. And lo and behold, the rule does this will actually kick in. And we also detected it on other finches, but there were raised in the same cohort, and the rule has actually worked together. And so, why is it interesting? Well, for one thing, zero finches actually are used in this nature versus nurture debate, right? Kind of figure out what is cultural and what is innate into the uh, bird. And so by finding out which rules fire and don't fire, we can actually address <coughs> that. Moreover, we can actually take some finches and we can knock out genes. So certain genes like the puppy too are known to actually um, affect speech and behavior and memory in humans, and the analog uh, genes in other finches probably do the same thing. So by basically knocking out combination of these genes, Looking at the rules that far, we can actually figure out potentially which genes are involved in which part of memory and speaking so forth. Actually, we're doing this right now, we have a grant for this. We're actually not doing it with other things, we're doing it with mice. It tends to actually mice sing just as well, and mice are actually easier to um, manipulate and knock out genes. But the same basic idea, with the same actually interesting results. So I think actually rule finding is going to be a very hot topic uh, in the next few years for time series data mining. So we've seen so far that if you do something such effectively and efficiently, you can do cool stuff. You can find anomalies, you can cluster non-trivial data sets, you can find repeated patterns and understand repeated behaviors in the marketplace, in the animal's behavior that might be. You can find rules, and if you can find rules, you can predict what happen next. Week. So all this is cool stuff, and you can do it in some research, assuming you do it effectively and efficiently. And my strong claim actually is that we're probably pretty close to being done here. We're probably as effective and efficient as we need to be, or can be. So, effective facility search simply means that we can maximize similarity in spite of some possible distortions or invariances in the data. So, we start, for example, for the images of the fish, they might be invariant to color, might be invariant to size, and so forth. For time series, the zebra finch example, what do you think it's invariant to? Well, we might be invariant to noise. We always have noise, we can't avoid that. Uniform scaling. In that case, the finch might sing a little faster, a little slower, if it's warmer or cold, from being very the scaling. And things like offset, amplitude, and so forth. As it happens, these are almost all critical to care of. One of them, warping, <coughs> I'll explain in a moment, is actually hard to care of computationally, but we can actually do it. So, let me show you just two distance measures that are actually very useful, and explain actually that these are probably all we need. The first is classic Euclidean distance. It's trivial, but very, very hard to beat. So it simply says, given two time series, measure distance between the i point and the i point, and those distances and touch lines here are basically squared, summed up, square root of them, and that's the Euclidean distance. And of course, I'm showing the two things apart here for visual clarity. Normally, I push the two sequences together by z-normalizing them so that the red they pop up the blue or vice versa. And for many real world objects, this is a very, very nice measure. So, for example, it turns out that all howler monkeys, sex species, they're basically the same skull. Right? There's not much difference. They have this massive jaw here, this kind of resonation, resonation chamber, to make a very, very loud sound. But here, basically, the eye point to the eye point corresponds to the tip of the nose, the tip of the nose, or the base of the jaw to the base of the jaw. And those are beautifully aligned. There's only one kind of howler monkey. And then this measure is called dynamic time warping. And here's quite a difference. Instead of mapping I to I, we can actually map the I point to the I plus one, or the I minus one, or two or three or four. And we can actually map a single point to multiple points. Right? It turns out actually this ability to map 
multiple things, multiple things, and to allow this kind of distortion in the time axis is very, very important for many biological and physical phenomena. So for starlight curves, and I'm going to put some of here, uh, for heartbeats, of course, for all kinds of behavior, we actually have to be able to do this one for many matters. So my visual example is actually this gorilla. So gorillas are highly sexually dimorphic, and the male skull, in fact, the female skull, much less different subspecies and tribes of gorilla. And so a movement or an um, increase in the size of the brow ridge, in one of the example, corresponds to a shift in the x-axis. And this warping, the number 10 warping, allows us to actually take care of this. So this dynamic time warping stuff turns out to be very, very useful. It's actually anything biological, you have to have it. And many other kinds of physical phenomena, you really have to have this. So I'll show you two of these measures, you clear the distance of the dynamic time warping. As it happens, the dynamic time warping is assumed to clear the distance as a special case. So really, I've only shown you one thing, which is dynamic time warping. Now if you look at the literature, you'll find hundreds, maybe a few thousand different distance measures. And my claim actually is that all works. Of course, the original author would not claim that. They published a paper where they tested their new method against the time warping on two data sets. They were better, and they said, thus, we are better, use this. And my claim is they're all wrong. So it's a strong claim to make, but let's actually kind of answer the question empirically. Let's do a bake off. And let's test on every publicly available data set. But to reduce a chance of data bias, of only picking data that are good for us, cherry picking, Let's test in every public data set in the world, and let's beg for every data set we can get a hands on. We have 43 of them. And we actually asked the original authors for their code, for their advice. We ran the algorithms, and we actually showed the results and said, can you make it better, and so forth. So it really is a very, very fair setup for this. So I've got lots of results, I can show you all of them, of course. But here's one typical example. Here's a paper that was published, actually, eight or nine papers published in the same algorithm in different places. And the claim was that this actually pre-questioning is better than dynamic time warping. That only dynamic time warping comes close to it, but really not all the way, it is better. But it turns out actually on fair experiments, it's always worse. And sometimes actually basically at the default rate. Essentially as good as random. So why did this person and other people make these mistakes? And of course, it's easy to make mistakes in machine learning, right? It's easy to overfit, it's easy to actually consciously, unconsciously bias the algorithms or bias the data sets or bias the kind of choices to make you look good. It's also easy to cripple a libel. So you can get the number 10 warping and you can implement it in certain ways that are naive to kind of make it right in effect. Now of course I'm not claiming that this individual or any other people deliberately did this, but they have done this. And it turns actually that of these hundreds of papers that have different measures, essentially they're all pretty much worthless. They're slower and less accurate, have more parameters. What's the point? Of course, there might be a data set out there somewhere in the world in which they are better than the dynamic warping, but I have a found data set and they haven't. So I think effectively it fits together. So my point actually is that if you need to find this measure, warping is probably all you need, and I have very, very strong proof of evidence to show that. So if you believe that warping is all you need, dynamic warping, now the question is is it effective? Is it fast? Because again, we have very large data potentially. And again, if you read the literature, people will say, no, it's too slow to be useful. If there's some quotes, the dynamic time warping incurs a heavy CPU cost. The dynamic time warping is limited only to small data sets, and so on and so forth. People pessimistically say the dynamic time warping is simply too slow for real, streaming, large, big data type problems. And once again, they're wrong. In fact, they've been wrong for 10 years, but now recently they've become a lot wronger. And I'll show you why. So, the dynamic time warping basically corresponds to taking the two time series and finding a path to this matrix which corresponds to some alignment. And essentially, if you go straight diagonally across here, it's Euclidean clear distance. If you go off to the diagonal, you're kind of stretching time or slowing down time to make one feature match that to another feature. And so any path to this is a warping path, and the path that minimizes the overall distance here is called dynamic time warping. I know I'm glossing over this, but that's why you can know about all this. Now clearly to do this for two time series is n squared. You can't avoid that. You can build a matrix with size n squared. But it happens, we almost never want to do one comparison. We have the one situation. We have a long stream of data, maybe a year of customer data, maybe a year of copy for this. And we have one query that we want to have, maybe our section of DNA or it might be. 
I'm going to find this is best matching anywhere within here. So this actually naively would be n squared large number of times. But about 10 years ago, I found a nice result that says that in this case here, you can just the amortized cost of number 10 morphin from n squared to n in this case. And I must because I did the LBQ. But actually, it happened to be my most famous result, and um, it's widely used. There's maybe a thousand references, of which about half of people actually use this. And so people use a simple idea in motion capture, query by common retrieval, all kinds of problems. It's actually caused an explosion of work in Duncan Warpin about 10 years ago. But the cool thing actually is, and I make the following claim, which is I can do better. I actually can now solve the problem in amortized constant time. And I really believe that's just going to open up a whole new area of data mining. The problems that were just simply untenable last year are now finally actually tenable. If we can actually do this in not in square time, but in constant time, we can look at really massive, massive problems. So let me give you some quick examples, and then I'm going to finish up for the day. So we can take a year of heartbeat data, which is about eight and a half billion data points. And by the way, I don't have a year of a single person, but I have hundreds of 24 hours for individual people, I just add them all together. So I can take a year of heartbeat data, and I can search the whole thing for a heartbeat in about 18 minutes. So this is much, much, much faster than real time. Another way I look at this actually is, I can actually embed the algorithm into an iPhone or into a small computer on a watch, and I can actually measure in real time on a very, very low-power computer. This actually, by the way, is an off-the-shelf Costco machine. It's not a simple computer. Another way I can show you this actually is by the size of the data we're actually looking at. So I call this the uh, UCR ED, it's the instant distance version, and the UCR Dumpton Warping, which is the constant time Dumpton Warping version. So about half the papers in the community that I work in, KDD, ICDM, ICML, and so forth, look at data sets that are smaller than a million. Most of them you know, don't get up to a million. We can actually do a million in about an eighth of a second. Only one paper in that community, including Sigma and the LDB, only one paper has ever looked at a billion time series. That happened with my paper three, four years ago. And we can search a billion objects, uh, time series objects, with an time warping in about two minutes. And again, this is a cost of computer, this is not a supercomputer. And then finally, no one's ever, ever looked at a trillion time series. In fact, if you take all the data sets in all those conferences and sum them all up, it's still less than a trillion objects. And we can actually look at trillion objects in about three hours in a certain distance, and in about a day and a half for the number of work. So I really do believe this simple result, which will be published in KD this year, is going to actually change time system mining in a way. It will simply address problems that are much, much, much larger than were tenable only a year ago. Lovely. So my conclusions. If you have stream of time series data, semantic search is a very simple idea, but algorithms that use that let you solve almost any problem you want to solve. Outlier discovery, anomaly discovery, rule discovery, repeat discovery, classification, clustering, segmentation, summarization, visualization, really all comes down to fast, clever semantic research. My other claim is, with very, very few exceptions, the Dunham Warfare is probably all you need. There's something else really out there that's better than that. And not, my final claim is that, based on unpublished results, that doing the Dunham Warfare on billions or trillions of objects is not actually tenable. We can now do that, or we couldn't do that last year, and certainly couldn't do it a few years ago. Great. At this point, I'm done. I have the questions. <laughs> Sir. Okay, you're searching uh, through a large database for something. And of course, everybody knows one of the hard problems is um, how do you evaluate the significance, the statistical significance of the search when you stop when you found something interesting. So there, there are two related questions that I have for you. Um, to solve that question, you need to know what you were looking for in the first place. That no method can find all possible rules. You, you must have some set of patterns or rules that you are looking for in the first place. So the first part of the question is, what is, what is that uh, description of that set? And then how do you, at the end, evaluate the statistical significance? Is that a great question? Uh, I like it. So the question here that we came back to you is, is how do you know the significance of what you find? So if you do outside discovery, you do real discovery and so forth, how do you know if it's interesting and significant? Um, 
So part of the answer to the question is, in some cases I don't. So I might think my lab, my skill set, is actually finding these patterns. And if I have significance, it's something that I'm not a skill, I'm not a position, I can do some stuff with it. Um, but in some cases, actually, the answer is external evaluation. So when I found these patterns, I went to the video and looked at this epidemiologist. So in some cases, the answer is kind of trivial. We ask someone to kind of follow the test. Visually, you might say here, it's actually close to the kind of visually. But there are some tricks that we can do in some cases. We're actually looking at MDL in the description event to not only find patterns, but basically score them and how likely they are to happen by chance. And if we know that it may unlikely happen by chance, we will give it some significance. That's one possibility. And another possibility is you can kind of learn the threshold. So, um, let's see here. So, this example here, we found an anomaly, and the question is how do you know if it's significant? Well, it's just into the scenario scenario is say phase five. In previous data that was undertaken, we did the same kind of test, and this is the nearest neighbor is always at a large distance, it's only 1.2. So we can simply say that compared to previous shuttle launches, this one appears to have a greater discord. But the general question, so there are some domain specific tricks you can do, but the general overall question about significance, I fully admit it's an open problem in number of all cases. And we almost always now at least with the have ad hoc to make kind of tricks. An overall theory of that would be wonderful. And probably not exactly that approach. I don't have that skill of that, but I'd love to work with somebody here who can help me with that. Is the question? Sir? How is this applied to multivariate uh, data? So how does it apply to multivariate data? Multivariate data. So I've shown you basically one dimensional data that's easy to see uh, on a screen, but almost all these algorithms could be applied to multivariate data. Uh, the only problem with that is, of course, that with enough variables, they tend to get all the correct dimensionality. I'm going to give you one example of this. We took some data set for American Sign Language. And the original data set had maybe 64 dimensions. So every single finger band is recorded, the echo position of patients, and so forth. And we got OK results in some dimensional data. But if you throw away all the four dimensions, it turns out, you actually get much better results. So really, in that case, the clever thing actually is, is throw away the other data, throw away the redundant data. And of course, our tricks to that, like FPD and other things, once again, we often reduce the kind of domain dependent tricks of asking the expert motion capture, asking the entomologist, which are the features. That's kind of a more general problem. But once you have to buy features, mm -hmm. all the algorithms generalize to every. That's what they should have. About 150 variables. Again, my previous experience suggests that there are very few problems in the world that need more than five variables. So, of those 150 you have, my guess actually is that either directly four or five them, or something a combination of them, that the four or five, will probably be enough. Uh, and if you use all 150 of them, you probably get bad results. So, the step you have to do to go from 150 to four or five, I, I really can help you with other than my consumer experiences. But if you do that off line by yourself with experts, and you need those five dimensions, that all this stuff works off the shelf. Uh, with uh, physiological data, yeah. it is uh, not a good idea to get rid of variables because we don't really know how many affect each other. So we really don't want to eliminate variables. So it really stays to 150. Uh, I think that if my colleague David Kale could be talking about it, then he has some data sets where for some diseases actually, you need these three or four dimensions. But for different diseases, you might need actually different dimensions. And really, I have no way of knowing that. And algorithmically, I might not discover it, but maybe not. But kind of pushing some general domain expertise really is helpful there. I think <laughs> my goal is to build totally black box algorithms, but it's always going to be very difficult. It's always going to take some expert to clean a little bit of energy, or at least be in the loop for multiple duration. But how about other categorical data or point processing data? Do you still believe in that end and what can you do with the data? And if so, how do you do it? But the other danger that I'll uh, come across in the guy who has a hammer and every problem is a nail. But in many cases, you take part of the data and you can make it into time series data. So I want to show you that DNA is actually very quickly changed into this. Things like text can be actually changed into the time series. Or the first text can be changed into time series. So my first pass is often to take the data and make it the time series as possible. Simply because I have fast, efficient tool algorithms for that. If it really is pretty categorical, you can't need to change it into the time series. Then, yeah, you have to kind of see how to link these things together. And then a mixture of these things, how they go from binary time series, it becomes a bit tricky. But 
But it depends on these ideas will work using an extra graphic rather than the configuration of the that. How about point process? I don't know what that means. Uh, you have uh, event pathways, like, say, event earthquake day. Um, again, without thinking about my guess, is probably some transformation might actually be tweak that into kind of time series. Uh, I mean, even things like graphs and XML, it's a bit unnatural, but you can't put it in the time series, and it can really be very fruitful. And often you hide that from the user. So the user is looking at graphs or tree or XML. Internally, the time series algorithm is working, and gives the results back. We just can't come back into the XML again, essentially. Uh, but to make it fast and efficient and effective, it can turn it into the time series. So if you find the right method, I probably can help you. Sir? Curious, in the, in the DNA sequence example, have you tried, obviously, the encoding from say A is D plus 1, C is D plus 2. That encoding is completely arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. Have you tested whether, if you use an alternate encoding, obviously the, the shape of the time series is going to be different, but whether the ultimate results are robust against playing with that encoding? Uh, it's a good question. The answer is we have tested that, and it makes no difference what we do. Uh, but it is, a, yeah, it's best. Uh, it makes no difference. So it is known that for certain animals, but it's not all the four basic features they have, but none. And maybe you could point out that it's a little bit higher variance than it might be. But at least in principle, that kind of rough scale we're working on, it makes a difference for the third. Um, you don't know what's under the hood with your algorithm yet, right? So I'll have to wait to find out your order constant. But uh, I assume it's parallel logical uh, in the sense that the order constant may not be fast enough. Uh, it's actually it's pretty parallelizable, so if you have a uh, hardware to code this, the pop out of that. Just on your example of the Costco PC. The, 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 the Costco PC? Yeah. Um, what, what were the sizes of the computer? Is it the exam again? Is that? Um, you said that you had a commodity PC. Oh, yeah, sorry. And that's you, um, you ran it on a billion. What were the sizes of these time periods? Uh, so the time has a length of trillion, the query is length uh, 128. But actually, uh, because of a constant time century, the length of it is almost irrelevant. So it was twice the long time series. It might be a tiny fraction slower, but not much. Bigger. As actually, the time I showed you actually includes a disk at this time. So it's about think, 8 terabytes sitting offline, but it's just on a very cheap external hard drive. It's actually for this problem that this time would be relevant to the price there to do that. So it's about 8 terabytes of data. Right. You mentioned noise as an invariant. Do you have a way of incorporating known measurement noise estimates? You have two time series, you know this one is noisier than this other one, or this particular subject is you know, 10 times noisier. Do you have a way of incorporating that into the search? Uh, maybe. So, in a certain case, actually, we have a measure called complexity uh, from the outset. Sometimes this is a bias of something that measure more complex things. Then the more complex things, it can be further away than you expect otherwise, than simple things that you do. And we can actually adjust for that. So these measures actually do allow kind of the main kind of adjustments. There might be that if you understand the domain very well, it might be. You might have to say, <coughs> take a log first and then do this, or whatever it might be, it was kind of smooth. And essentially, anything you do, you can then probably it not. So you can tweak a pre-process or even push some of these ideas into the measures directly, and it's probably no difference between kind of uh, time and uh, what I do. But again, it kind of requires you to understand the physics of the main uh, I don't know where my hands off that. Yes, do you have any idea of the distance of Google correlate to you? Google correlate. Uh, it's been just a function of the uh, Google Trends. Oh, yes. And do you have any idea of the kind of uh, instance they use the instance? Uh, I haven't worked with the um, Google Trends thing. Um, I have looked at, you know, before Google Trends came out, Microsoft gave me some of the data to fix into this. And actually, I have looked at this a little bit. Especially if I'm not but I don't really have any great experience or feedback with that. Yes, so EGM, the same slide, we ignore the. I can't find that. Yeah, so Sorry, for the ETM, it seems like we ignore the lead lag relationship between those two series. For some time, it's kind of lead lag, but information could be interesting. Lag? Yeah, lead or lag. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, Sorry. Um, but the question was about involving the lag. So, for the uh, rule example, 
particular, in the first example of the arrangement, I said there's no lag, that immediately after the as seen by the consequence of having uh, But actually, we generalized this actually to handle the current variability. Let me give you a nice example of this. We had a set of archives in iPhones, and we found this data set where we actually got this beautiful kind of a concave lip, and then a flat piece, and then a reverse concave lip, and a flat piece. And what I try to do is the elevator. You went to the elevator, and there's no acceleration initially in this direction, of course. The elevator starts up, then you get this kind of acceleration. The elevator stops, you get a little bit again. Now, the, the linear lag between those depends on how many floors you have. So we learned the rule in our building, which has four elevators, uh, four um, floors, and we had a maximum lag. But of course, I go to New York to have these new skyscrapers, the lag can lead to be much, much larger. Um, so we, we never had a little bit of that uh, from that. And of course, the main expert can come in and manually edit that, saying, in Hong Kong, you need a longer lead lag. Uh, but so that will be the main depend, of course, too, for benches and for that, how do you how do you code your shape as a fun series? Do you yeah. get something that's not star shaped? How do you code that? Uh, I'll show you one way to take a shape and make it fun series. There's at least 20 different ways of doing that. And some are better for kind of convex or convex shapes, some are better for spiky or smooth shapes. The answer to that, I don't really care. Um, I need those ways to focus your data set, do it, and give me a time series, and I will do search uh, But there are many math things. But I showed that tonight because it's lost. It's actually one point math. The is lost. Mm -hmm. But to some extent, I, I don't care how you take it. Sure, I mean, it's, again, there are at least plenty of ways of doing this. And some actually do work with donuts, like Holton. Some don't work with donut shaped things. Um, just pick one that's popular to me. And whatever it is, you can answer and it's all work to do. So, the right question If you had an image and it is a grid of pixels and each one has a value, can you? Uh, encode that to the time series as well. But the question is, you have a, a grid, you have a box solve and brain scan, and you have values each part of the grid, and you have to make it time series. You actually have done this like a Hilbert uh, space time chart, where you actually fill the space, and you take the single path and stretch it out, and measure that curve, and it practically deserves a calculate on that. I haven't done it personally, but I told you actually have done that. And again, people I know have done that and used some of the algorithms. So there are many ways to get that and that's the time series. And these are kind of many dependent. Once you do it in a meaningful way, I can probably help you a little bit. Uh, but how you do that will depend on the properties of your data basically. So you mentioned about uh, reflecting images before you do a mapping yes. process itself. What about things like rotating algebraic when you're thinking of the character? It's actually a great question, but it's an example of the main dependence and variances. So um, so the question is basically what kind of variances you want in the decision example. Almost certainly you left the light has no meaning. The question is, will you allow location variance? First of all, if you want to allow location variance, I can tell you the time series space. Because location variance becomes phase invariance of time series space, you can easily deal with it. When you want to not depend, right? So if you imagine the letters, I don't want to take the D, but if I take the D enough to come to T, I can't do rotation there. I might do limit rotation, I might say if D can rotate. 10 degrees, half by parts, but no more than that. But that's the question is, there's always the kind of the main attendant information you have to put in to constrain the warping, to constrain the phase variance you kind of live. And you usually have to either learn those and not to die, or have an extra plug. But the other way I showed actually can handle essentially any the variances, whether it's offset, scale, rotation, phase, measure of scale, we can handle all of those. Just tell us which ones to handle, or give us that we can learn that. So the question is how do you deal with irregularly sample data sets? So um, you know, here we have every single point. So we have every single point here. What happens with emission points? Yes, I have actually a magic solution to that. If we have a few emission points, you will smooth and cut right on the walk away. But if you have significant amount of emission data, the entire day's emission that is based on the bad weather of this, um, the answer I don't actually know. And again, maybe some of the main tenants, right, would handle that. Um, that's the problem with like for ethical power land. We basically have a problem occasionally, and we go to last year's data, take last year's data, and put it to place this year's data. And some problems like that works fine. It's a problem that can cause a huge uh, problem, right? because maybe last year the World Cup was a little day, 
we should have worked with nothing that day, and we had this incredibly biased uh, results. So it, it's a generally tough problem that I have to make decisions very hard for you. Are you able to point to sample code and a data set for this approach? Oh, sure. It's actually, I'm expecting that um, I religiously believe in giving away all data and giving away all code. So if you go to my website, find my email address, or uh, I'll be online. Uh, I need the code and family one folder. Thanks so much. Okay, we we'll have a couple more questions. Uh, so as predicted, Google did terribly in picking up your accent. <laughs> uh, if you look on the stack, uh, it's in New York and it's in bed. Have you, uh, you've obviously talked about doing um, some sort of speech recognition uh, and sort of potentially mapping parts of speech. Um, and you showed us the call example. Have you tried this with sort of a speech bank and done this in a generic way where you actually tried to do better than what we, we have here? That's actually, I, I have not actually, actually, I only use the speech version because actually we all know the right answer and it's kind of intuitive. But I, I have no particular skills in speech. Speech normally, of course, is a very high dimension, maybe 44,000 hertz signal. And the MRC thing I do makes it into a low dimensional, relatively smooth changing thing where I can find rules in it. It's never a good transformation. But in terms of actual speech stuff, I'm not an expert in that, and I'm not going to compete with them. I'm only using it as an example of what I can do. But in terms of your, in terms of your search, you're not actually trying to find rules, but you're just trying to find matches. This is a perfect example. Oh, yes, actually. You had as a big bank of, of people speaking. <coughs> you had those well labeled. And for new uh, English speech, you can just search. No, this is actually so. The number time warping actually is very competitive with everything else in speech in terms of you know, market models that might be. The number time warping tends to perform almost as good as anything else out there for speech. It's a very simple algorithm. People often don't use it because they say it's too slow. But again, I'm hoping that will change uh, people's minds. Actually, it is very, very fast. So we can search speech much as fast as in real time, even on a low power device now. Uh, just to argue with you were uh, said about speech, uh, what you had said where you weren't able you were able to do male American accent to male American accent, but weren't able to go to female or foreign accent. A lot of the challenges of looking at speech involve two varieties of speakers. People like you and I have a harder to understand most people than most people in this room. A lot of channel effects, and sure. I mean, trying to be very of these channel effects. And a lot of what makes uh, actually searching speech and doing effective speech effects work harder than a lot of that is are exactly the same thing we talked about that tends to help with the dynamic So I think overstating can be there. So and it is true actually that um, uh, I think maybe I could do better for speech if I deliberately, you know, if I took the time to understand it better, that people have this very ability to get excited to talk about it and get calm talk slower. I can actually encode that really from a statement. And I can encode some other things that actually might help to be more than very active, more than very and so forth. Um, again, it would probably take some of the main work to map that and to disturb that into the MRPC space. If the data in that space is reasonable, it probably going to help you a lot. Actually, yeah, I want to find out that actually, I'm not an expert in speech, but people do use something more in speech and it's quite successful and quite uh, competitive. But they do understand speech better and actually do these transformations and tricks with the value I can do. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a similar question actually since you mentioned these and these earlier. Has it been tried on optical character recognition? Uh, we have actually, there are transformations of single characters and even kind of words into answer space. Uh, so, we actually have that as for strictly for um, sort of manuscripts. So, some of them have that sort of Washington's, you know, one to a million word icons. And it's, it's joint kind of icons. They take the top profile and the bottom profile is joint word and it becomes two time series. And you search in that space and it actually is competitive with all the other approaches. But many approaches can be kind of Twisted into a time series type of a problem. And usually that happens, if the map is anyway reasonable, time series is both A affected, because the hands match a very ability of human lightning. And it's quite efficient now, as you can see. Actually, I was more interested in something that is printed but not English, because for many Asian languages, there are no good optical characters in like this. And if given printed text, it would be easier to do an interpretation. I think that's what we actually have tried for some things um, uh, like Croatian and Thai. Which is, you know, it's hard to find good off the shop that kind of photo, but I'm sure that you can believe that. Uh, and actually, we actually have some very good results. It's it kind of a special domain, and actually, no one's talking about that domain, like assembly and assembly. No one's kind of thing can help. I don't know that, but just as a quick 
you have to tie this thing actually, it works quite well. Okay, I'm going to finish up the question on my own. A more abstract one. You, you clearly worked in, in a number of domains, and in answering these questions, a number of domain specific questions, and you've indicated a couple of times the difficulty of tackling problems in different domains with a single tool, and there's challenges to each domain. I wanted to ask you to reflect a bit more on multidisciplinary and, and domain knowledge. I think it's of interest to everyone here to understand a bit more about how we generalize ideas between domains. Okay. Uh, so this question, I do work in lots of domains, but it's interesting stuff. Uh, what I want to actually is um, NSF likes that, and uh, some communities like it. So I've actually published papers with anthropologists, neonatologists, entomologists, herpetologists, astronomers, cardiologists, but you have all these in there. And so it's actually it's like fun, interesting, and yeah, fun things to kind of like that. Um, I kind of actually build sort of tools that are kind of abstract, that is a layer where you have to take your data, you have to clean it, you process it, and normalize it to make a kind of time series thing. But once you've done that, you can plug it into my various tools, and you can find the anomalies, the outliers, the big patterns, and so forth. So it is an abstraction layer where we can actually have a domain expert typically tell us that this doesn't matter, but this does matter, and this matters a little bit, what it might be, and that transformation. But it shouldn't be a black box to that point, I think, uh, after that. And what I read domain expert is, some of them really know what they want, but they really can't express it. You have to really work very carefully with them, kind of tease out of them what it actually is. Often say you could acknowledge, and they can't do their math and they don't know what to do. Uh, but I think that they can't make that. Fantastic. Okay, let's thank you again for a wonderful talk. Can I invite Damien to come up?